All right, uh, we're talking about shape memory polymers, and I've shown this video before, and uh, this is a shape memory polymer blend uh, that we developed in the lab. And uh, when we first developed it, we didn't realize it had shape memory polymers till uh, we started just doing some experiments and found that it had uh, shape memory polymers, and uh, we published a paper on it. <clears throat> and uh, I'll show uh, some of the details of uh, this work uh, later on in this lecture. Uh, what we're going to talk about is we're going to kind of talk about shape memory effect in metals and talk about how that differs from the shape memory effects in polymers. And uh, we'll talk about how you evaluate um, a shape memory polymer system. And I'll kind of share some of the research that we've done in my lab and it's pretty cool stuff, so I sincerely hope you all enjoy it. Um, shape memory materials, uh, probably nitinol is the most uh, famous uh, shape memory metal. And I think they've even made uh, like eyeglass frames out of it. And it's very common in uh, the biomedical world in the form of heart stints. And a heart stint is if you have a narrow or clogged artery in your heart, um, they can put this in the artery and I think they go up through your leg. I don't, I don't quite, I'm not a cardiologist in any way. And, uh, but I think they go through like the big artery in your leg actually. And at least that's how they probe to see if you have the problem. Um, anywho, this, uh, let me get to my laser pointer as always. Um, this would be the temporary form and this would be the permanent form. So they insert it smaller and then it heats up and uh, then expands the uh, the valve so blood can continue to flow. Um, there is uh, probably some problems um, associated with this because uh, it won't last forever in the human body. And uh, I've been told maybe about five years is the lifespan. And there's probably some research out there um, kind of telling telling you all about that if you're 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 so interested and I kind of think this is kind of interesting so night and all devices and components is a J and J company and uh, I don't have the year on this so I feel kind of bad so it feels like it's kind of old but Fremont California it's in the Bay Area and um, kind of close to Silicon Valley it's right adjacent to Silicon Valley um, anywho uh, kind of digressing there a little bit um, but night and all um, probably the most famous uh, shape memory metal. And uh, so let's look at the mechanism. So we'll, we'll see how the mechanism of a shape memory effect in nitinol um, is different than that in uh, polymers. And uh, so we kind of have this, I got it from this uh, Smart Wires um, webpage and it's a company that makes, makes nitinol. And uh, the shape memory effect in nitinol was discovered by Bueller and uh, who that actually is a metallurgical supply guy. Uh, we have several polishing wheels in our lab. Um, if you've had the pleasure of using them. And uh, it's the austenite martensite transition. And I tend to point out um, that phases are based on how they look optically, basically. Um, austenite, um, I think, first identified in uh, iron carbon steel. Uh, but iron carbon steel, uh, the phase uh, or, the, or the crystal structure of austenite in uh, iron carbon steel is uh, face centered cubic. And a martensite in uh, iron carbon steel is um, body centered tetragonal. Um, so it's still needle like though, okay? So the phases are, are um, defined by basically how they look optically, not their actual crystal structure. So I kind of wanted to point that out, even though this is a polymers class and not a metals class. Um, here, uh, the martensite is still needle like and lath like, and uh, the deformation um, occurs at room temperature. Okay, and the permanent shape is programmed at a much higher temperature. So depending on the alloy composition, the transition temperature is uh, between 86 degrees Fahrenheit and uh, 130 degrees Fahrenheit. And the reason why I, I led with Fahrenheit, um, even though it's, I guess, more scientific to use centigrade, is that we're more familiar, well, at least in the United States, we're more familiar with using Fahrenheit and 96.8 uh, is a normal temperature. And so you can see that the transition temperature could be tuned depending on the alloy composition to be uh, changed, be switched by the body temperature. And so when you're using it for um, a stint like this, um, it becomes very, very important to um, um, be able to switch it with just the body temperature. Because uh, when you start adding other stimuli, external stimuli, um, you, uh, 
you maybe run into some problems, you know, the body's interaction with external radiation or that kind of thing. So you can tune the night nail to actually um, switch based on the body temperature. And uh, the needle structure uh, basically is, you can consider that a domain. Um, you, you program it in the austenitic form. It cools to martensite, but it holds its shape even though there's a phase transformation. It's actually kind of cool. You put some deformation into the material, that strains the lattice. Uh, you heat it up again to the austenite, but you're heating it up lower than your programming temperature. So you heat it up, phase transformation occurs, it goes back to cubic, releases the strain in its lattice, actually remembers its programmed form, and then when it cools back down, it cools back down to the original programmed form. So um, this spring, if you will, this coil, if you will, um, the program that was programmed at roughly 500 degrees C here, um, it cooled down, it was coiled tighter at room temperature, and then inserted into the body, and the body temperature um, basically allowed the stresses induced on these martensitic domains, if you will, uh, allowed those that stress to be relieved, and it coiled back out to its bigger uh, spring state. And in the body, it'll allow more blood to flow through uh, the artery. So it's kind of cool. Um, here's a video. So I want to kind of show you that, um, hold on, I got to change my pointer because it's like recording every recording. So sorry about that. There we go. And so, oh, here we go. It's a very, very fast. So here's the night and all deforming at room temperature, ah, wrecked it. And then uh, it did, the video didn't say what the temperature of the water is, but we can assume it's between 86 and 130 uh, Fahrenheit. It's not boiling, so actually I can assume it's it's uh, um, a little lower. And so there we go, very fast. And this is real time, very fast transformation. The video I showed you at the beginning was actually sped up. So the, um, the uh, effect of shape memory in a polymer is much slower than that in itanol. So nitinol, if you want a fast response, uh, metal it seems to be the way to go as, as opposed to polymers. And I got this uh, video from YouTube. Um, most shape memory alloys are really only capable of memorizing one shape. And so that's kind of a detractor for shape memory um, alloys, for metal shape memory alloys. Uh, so program, deform it, and then it goes back to its program shape. Um, after it's usually heat stimulated as well, although there is some room temperature deformation going on. Uh, polymers are a little bit different. So shape memory polymers are a tad more complex. And uh, so there's different mechanisms. There's actually three mechanisms uh, that can come in play depending on what type of uh, polymeric system you're dealing with. Uh, whereas here it's purely uh, one mechanism. It's a phase change mechanism. Solid state though, we're not melting it at all. Uh, but it's a phase change mechanism between BCC and uh, BCM. So body centered cubic, base centered monoclinic. Um, one thing I didn't point out was that one of the lattice parameters is retained between the austenitic and martensitic state. Um, if they're understanding the color coding uh, correctly, um, the basal plane shifts. And uh, so there is some really big time distortion going on. But anyway, try to visualize that. Um, shape memory, so here's PLA, has shape memory properties, so polylactic acid, I do a lot of work in polylactic acid, uh, it's a biodegradable uh, material, has biomedical applications, it's pretty cool. And um, here uh, is just a little experiment, I actually coiled it up and then threw it in the water um, above the glass transition temperature, so the glass transition temperature of PLA is roughly 70-ish centigrade, so this water is at 75, 80 degrees centigrade and uh, springs back out, actually pretty cool. And uh, kind of similar, it was my own uh, rendition of a, of a stint perhaps, I did this on my kitchen table. This is real time, so you see that it's actually pretty slow um, as compared to that night and all transformation, which was like this. And uh, so anyway, PLA does indeed have shape memory properties inherently. Um, you have to heat it up to deform it though. You don't, you can't really deform PLA at room temperature to uh, anything too dramatic because it's a fairly brittle polymer. Um, here's kind of a more scientific, it's the same 
thing that the video is based on. So this was the original, I 3D printed it. Um, this is just PLA I bought from like Amazon and printed this little spring structure on my printer. Um, this was the original length. So we're roughly, uh, I don't know, 7.2 centimeters, if I'm guessing that right, little angle for documentation on my part, I apologize. Uh, but you're gonna get the picture. We heated it up, deformed it. So we deformed it by coiling it up and then uh, we threw it in the water and it recovered on its own and it got pretty close. I mean, you can get real nitty gritty and say, well, we didn't get exactly, this looks a little off, but also the, I was using my phone, so maybe the camera's screwed, skewed. Uh, but we wanna ask, what, what is the mechanism of, of shape memory for polylactic acid? Uh, polylactic acid is of course a polyester. It's uh, derived from corn in the United States, sugar in Asia. And anyway, so what is the shape uh, memory mechanism for PLA? Um, PLA is pretty interesting. So you have some entanglements and uh, entanglements kind of count as a cross link. And uh, but then where it's not entangled, you have free segments of, uh, of these chains, okay? And so when we heat it um, around the glass transition temperature, some things start to happen. So these segments are able to move around. Remember things kind of roll and stuff when the polymer chains move. So there's some kind of dynamic action uh, that's occurring here. And uh, kind of my painstakingly drawn picture, um, the thermal vibrations, they're actually allowing the chains, excuse me, allowing the chains to move over one another and actually rolling over one another. So kind of remember that. Um, kind of refreshing your memory. So liquid-like is way above the glass transition temperature. So the chains are vibrating like crazy. Just above the trans, uh, glass transition temperature, they're, uh, they're rubbery, okay? And so now we have some chain vibration, the chains are free to move, um, but at low temperature, they're actually Bertolite properties. So this type of deformation um, going from uh, my opened up spring, my opened up spring to this coil type structure, I could only have done this um, in a heated state. So around the glass transition temperature. And I generally do it just below the glass transition temperature. And I'll kind of show with you kind of my recipe um, or show you kind of my recipe for that here in a bit. Um, so you heat it up, these chains are free to move about. And uh, so deformation can happen. And uh, we kind of talked about this and kind of refreshing your memory again. So here at the glass transition, you kind of get this rubbery plateau and then you kind of get rubbery flow, then you get liquid-like flow. So we're nowhere near the liquid-like flow when we're um, playing around with putting temporary shapes in this stuff. We're more on the rubbery plateau, rubbery flow region, and actually pretty close, closer to here. So we're kind of still relatively low temperature um, as opposed to say, uh, like when I'm 3D printing. So if, to keep in mind uh, the temperature differences, when I 3D print PLA, I'm roughly at, um, I wanna say like 200, 10 degrees, 220 maybe max. So well above the glass transition temperature. So I'm actually in the liquid like flow region. Uh, when I'm changing shapes, I'm around you know, 65, 70 degrees C. And I'll kind of show you, again, I'll show you the recipe uh, that I do. All right, so in terms of a recipe, uh, DMA, um, I find becomes uh, pretty critical here. And uh, so when I'm, I'm if, especially when dealing with new materials and stuff like that, or materials we've made in the lab, um, DMA becomes pretty important. And so we talked about uh, using DMA to determine glass transition temperature, and I'm sorry for the lag. I don't know if you notice it's a lag on my laser pointer, um, but where we start having the glassy onset is generally where I deform my material. And at the max tan delta temperature here, and uh, I tend to use that as my recovery temperature. And so that's kind of how I set up a recipe for, for these heat activated uh, shape memory polymers. And a kind of refreshing memory we're talking about. We're talking about the shape memory mechanism in uh, polylactic acid, PLA. And so these entanglements are, uh, are, are there, but then you have these free sections which move about when you heat up the material. 
and uh, when they cool off, they cool off in a temporary shape. So I kind of have a cheesy schematic. Um, but again, here's the recipe. So we tend to deform at the glassy onset and we recover at max 10 delta. Um, what's happening here, so I have here, this is one form of dual state. So here's your uh, programmed shape. And uh, I do a lot of stuff with 3D printer structures. So I'm programming at a much higher temperature. So I'm using my printer to actually program the shape. So the as printed state when I do this stuff is um, um, the programmed shape. Um, you can of course heat it up in an oven again and put a new shape and we've done that in the lab too. Um, so that's actually pretty cool. Um, so we can uh, heat it up um, just below the glass transition temperature, kind of in the regime of the glass transition temperature. So I tend to use again the, the glassy onset here and I don't know why it lags so much, I apologize, but you probably can't notice it's lagging and I should probably just be quiet about it. Um, so we heat it up to a temporary shape. So these three segments have a, a different form. They're in a different state. Um, and then you heat it up again. So in the example I showed, uh, I threw it in water, hot water, and uh, the shape memory effect happens. So the free segments become rubbery again. And uh, these cross links, I'm calling them soft cross links because they're entangled uh, for PLA anyway. It's not a, there's not covalently bonded crosslinks unless I've done something to it. Um, but in the state I have with the PLA I have, it's a soft crosslink. So it's like chain entanglement actually. Um, so again, we heat it up, the freak segments become uh, rubbery. We can deform it, um, let it cool. So it's in its temporary shape. Uh, we heat it up again, uh, this time above the glass transition temperature. And uh, these segments again become rubbery and then these soft crosslinks pull it back to the original shape. And you saw kind of a better example, uh, excuse me, back here. So better than my little lines. But anyway, what's happening here again, um, it's cold. You heat it up. The free segments allow, allow it to deform to this state. And then you heat it up again. And then the soft crosslinks pull it back to this shape. Excuse me while I click about. Um, these mechanisms, so there's three main mechanisms. This is a pretty good article talking about uh, the three mechanisms of the shape memory effect. And if you notice here, I said one form of the dual state, okay? Um, there are three shape memory effect mechanisms. So one, this is the dual state. And this article describes dual state a little bit differently uh, than I describe it here for PLA. Um, there is the dual component mechanism and uh, which has a truly hard and truly soft component. A lot of times in dual state, people refer to the cross-linked, whether it's a covalent bond or an entanglement as uh, the hard um, segment and the free moving of chains or the free segments of the chains, the soft component. Um, here, um, you could have two phases. So you could have a rubbery phase and you could have a hard phase. So this is dual component. And a partial transition is something kind of different. And the example that this uh, article uses is they have a sponge and they um, infiltrate it with paraffin wax, which melts at a real low temperature. And so when the wax is still liquidy, um, they impart a different shape and then let it cool. So that's the temporary shape. When they heat the wax up to a liquid state, um, the sponge takes over and goes back to its original shape. And I probably should have put a picture of that in here, um, but that's partial, uh, transition mechanism. I'll, I'll upload this article because um, it's a good article for you all to read. And um, anywho, so three main states, uh, dual state, dual component, and partial transition. Uh, the most common is probably dual component actually. So PLA inherently has a dual state mechanism, um, but you can make a dual component uh, material system out of uh, PLA and other, other materials as well. Um, the article describes dual state slightly different than I have described it in uh, um, the previous slides. So this is assuming that you have covalently bonded cross shapes, or sorry, cross links, in addition to uh, weak cross links or these chain entanglements. And so this is still another form of dual state because it's still just one material, but perhaps it's heavily cross linked. And um, so you have two flavors of, of crosslinks. So you have strong and weak crosslinks. And in this description of the dual state, 
um, they're saying that the covalently bonded or harder crosslinks uh, remember the shape, whereas a temporary shape is uh, maintained by weak, weak, weak crosslinks. So what they're saying here is that you heat it up, the weak crosslinks are broken, you can deform it, and then as it cools again, the weak crosslinks come back and hold that temporary shape. When you heat it up again, the weak crosslinks um, are undone basically, but these covalently bonded crosslinks are much harder to destroy and they actually remember the program shape. Um, dual components a little bit different. Okay, so here um, I do a lot with a blending rubbers, right? And I've shown this uh, in previous lectures where we typically kind of do like rubber toughening. And uh, I've shown uh, styrene, ethylene, butylene, styrene. And so the styrenic block would be the hard component and the ethylene butylene uh, would be um, soft, would be the soft matrix um, or soft component. And when you heat it up, uh, that soft component, um, I'm sorry, when you heat it up, the hard component actually softens, right? Because the butylene is always soft and um, you heat up the hard component, allows it to deform, but the hard component's gonna remember what it was basically. And when you heat it up again, um, the rubber actually facilitates the movement back. So um, hopefully that is uh, well explained. So the temporary shapes maintained by the soft component by the rubber basically, and the program shape is remembered by the hard component or the sterinic block. And so that sterinic block is basically heated and strained, but it's an unnatural state, if you will. When you heat it up again, it wants to release its energy and uh, go back to where it was. But the movement is facilitated by the rubbery phase, basically. And the temporary shape is driven uh, by the rubbery phase. Um, so I deal mostly with thermally sensitive shape memory, uh, shape memory polymers. And, um, but there's other um, types of, uh, of uh, shape memory polymers. So you can design materials uh, that can react upon water, react upon light, um, and react upon chemical reactions, basically. And even my net magnetic, um, the, this kind of magnetic thing's a little misleading in some ways, because a lot of times when they put in like magnetite, um, they'll apply an electric field to the magnetite and uh, it just gets hot. So it's you, you've put something in it that allows heat to be activated by an external stimulus other than heat. So you just in situ make it hot, basically. Um, what's interesting is that you can get to points where you've, you've remembered multiple shapes with your uh, shape memory polymers as well. So they're a little bit more than uh, what you see with the metals. So you can actually make a more diverse array of shapes. Um, you can make stuff that's uh, ambulatory. Um, so it supposedly will pave ways for like robots to walk, little robots uh, to walk and stuff like that. And this is another uh, good article. Um, that kind of talks about, you know, kind of, well, the title alone says it, Recent Advances in Shape Memory Structures. Fairly, oh, it's a little old now, it's 2012, but uh, still cool stuff. Um, to get multiple shapes, you uh, kind of need multiple phases. And so if you look at a dual state, and I, I, I kind of feel like I, don't exp I didn't explain this very well, uh, but with dual state, you can really only get one shape. If you have dual component, um, you can actually get more than one shape uh, because I'm, I'm talking about softening the hard component to deform it. Um, well, sometimes it doesn't, it doesn't deform, right? So you could actually, the way this is being explained is actually only the rubber components deforming, right? When you heat it up and I explained it a little bit differently. So you can have different temperature regimes. So if you heat it up, so only the rubber um, component deforms more than it would if I just had it at room temperature. Um, the shape is going to be maintained um, by the soft component if I haven't deformed the hard component. You can heat it up to another higher temperature and actually soften the hard component and then you can actually get two shapes um, remembered by the material system. It's actually kind of cool. Um, so you can get multiple uh, multiple shapes in one system rather than you know a one-way type of thing. Um, so anyway, you can do, uh, this is kind of, kind of, kind of hooky, but it shows two intermediate shapes is really what this is showing. Uh, this is the programmed shape or the remembered shape. You can kind of have this intermediate shape 
if you uh, only activate one of the phases and then you can heat it up and activate say the hard component and you'd get get it more elongated um, heat it up again to um, only activate the hard component heat it up again to activate the soft component i think i'm backwards and then you get back to the uh, the smaller phase um so i'm going to kind of show this and uh, I don't know if you can hear the music, but this is just playing around the little dinosaur. It's the same PLA I made the uh, um, little spring out of. And so I heat it up, bend the dinosaur's tail, cool it off, and then boom, it goes back. And so this is hooky. This is kind of fun. Um, but the question we want to have as engineers is how do we actually evaluate the properties scientifically? And the uh, way you do that is with a standard tensile test. And uh, they actually uh, used PLA, but they put uh, uh, very similar to urethane, polyurethane in their material. And, uh, but they heated it. Oh, actually, no, I, I, I'm lying. They uh, um, pulled it at actually room temperature. And um, excuse me, so according to this diagram, they pulled it at room temperature. Uh, most people actually um, heat it up and then stretch it. And uh, that's actually the norm. And so these guys were kind of bucking the system and I kind of bucked the system a little bit as well. And I'll show you uh, further. Um, so this is the original printed dog bone specimen. It looks like a type four uh, ASTM tensile test specimen. Uh, they pull it in a tensile test machine, then heat it up and it recovers its, uh, its shape. And um, they used water. Um, you know, I, I, I use water too, but you can also use an oven. And they got a pretty, according to this, it looks like they got a pretty quick recovery, right? So they're actually putting the time on their uh, little figure here. And um, so how do, you, how do you quantify this? Well, you can, you can measure it. And there's a systematic way to what you do with the measurements. There's two key parameters. Uh, to describe the shape memory effect, so the fix, fixity ratio, and I've been bashed for calling it the fixity ratio. Um, fixation uh, is uh, the other ratio, but I've seen this in print, so I didn't make it up. And uh, so you pull the specimen to 100%. Uh, you typically want to hold it for a little bit, and that's a maximum elongation. So typically 100%. Um, sometimes your material can't reach 100% if you're at room temperature. Uh, but 100% is generally the norm and uh, you release it. Okay. So you pull it, you release it and any difference between what it is after you've released it from the grips to what your maximum elongation was. So say this is 100%. So, you know, it's going to be 100% and say this is, uh, you know, it's shrunk back down to like 70 or something, right? Um, you'd get, um, 0.7 divided by one basically, and uh, multiply that by 100. So your fixis fixity ratio would be 70%. Uh, recovery ratio is, uh, so you heat it up and then you measure the elongation again. So 100% um, elongation minus whatever this is um, over 100% elongation gives you a recovery ratio. And so you can uh, basically evaluate um, your shape memory polymer in terms of uh, fixation and recovery. And uh, here's kind of an example. Uh, so shape memory demonstration. So we, we, we use a different rubber. So I, I'm, I use SEBS quite a bit in my lab. I've also done work with urethane. And um, we have uh, this blend. And um, we measured our gauge, 25 millimeters. Uh, we pulled it um, to 100% elongation. You actually see there's some severe necking. And it's a little bit different than uh, what this uh, study showed. This study didn't really show that severe of necking. And uh, so with this is different material system we're using in my lab. And uh, so we actually see some, some pretty severe necking. Uh, we recovered it in an oven and uh, pretty much got it back to a pretty good uh, temperature. So fixity, right? We pulled it to 100% elongation, but it shrunk back. Right, so it sprang back a little bit, so it didn't hold its its uh, temporary shape as much. So we have a fixity ratio, 88%. Uh, when we threw it in the oven, okay, we were able to get back to 97%. So that's that's pretty decent. That's pretty good. 
and we heated it at 80 degrees C. So I don't have the DMA spectra, I shouldn't say spectra, excuse me, the DNA, DMA graph of this material system to show you why we picked these temperatures. Um, and I should probably show that to you, but I probably won't. Um, anyway, uh, we recovered it and we expressed it in terms of percent this time. So uh, fixation in terms of percent and, um, and recovery in terms of percent. Um, kind of showing some other work we've done. So I've shown this article several times and uh, we, we kind of showed our first rubberized blends and we kind of showed we can control the mechanical properties by rubber content. Um, we found that these two, and, and we didn't really play around with the others. I know that 90% also has shape memory properties. Um, and SEBS by itself actually has shape memory properties, but ABS does not uh, have, have decent shape memory properties anyway. And, uh, but we played around uh, mostly with these two uh, blend compositions, um, SEBS and, and uh, ABS. And uh, we, we found that they, they actually had shape memory properties. And uh, so we did a lot. So we, again, we do a lot with um, um, additive manufacturing. And uh, so one thing that's important is the raster pattern. So we did uh, three raster patterns here. So longitudinal um, is where the raster pattern is in line. It's, it's parallel to the direction of applied stress. Uh, Crosshatch, we um, had 45 degree angle. So it's like an X and uh, then transversal, um, it went like this. Okay, so it was, it was um, perpendicular to uh, the applied um, stress. And uh, we did three, uh, we actually did three different uh, um, temperature regimes. So it was actually kind of cool. Um, but uh, we found a lot of things. We found that the shape memory properties actually varied with raster pattern. And so you can see the longitudinal uh, gave us the best recovery, okay? And so this crosshatch, not quite as well. Okay, this is the original shape, mind you. And uh, the transversal wasn't too hot either. And uh, so program deformed, recovered. So this is programmed, we deformed it, and then we recovered it. And I'm not giving that much away on this slide, or not telling the full story on this slide. Uh, but another thing that we showed uh, was that the phases are actually aligned by the printing process, okay? And so the phases are aligned um, with the direction of applied stress, basically. And um, that was kind of interesting. So phase alignment plays a role in uh, shape memory properties. And uh, we kind of found that and published it in this uh, article here. Um, other things we found, so this is out of the same article. Uh, we found that, um, so we did this at room and low temperature, and low temperature minus 40 degrees C, so we cooled, it, we cooled the, the specimen chamber with LN2. And uh, you can see, so this is um, fixity ratio or fixation ratio, and this is recovery ratio. And we can see that the recovery, it didn't matter. Um, the way it recovered was not that dependent upon um, raster pattern. Okay, there's no st real statistical difference. Okay, and um, and so you want to compare 25 degrees, 25 degrees, 25 degrees, and so yeah, okay, this recovery is maybe a little lower, but now the error bars tend to overlap. I don't know why I'm debating with my own data, um, but anyway, not heavy dependence on a raster pattern, but fixity or fixation uh, was heavily dependent on uh, on raster patterns. So this longitudinal had a much better uh, fixation than, um, than the other two raster patterns we studied. Uh, when we deformed it at an elevated temperature, and uh, the elevated temperature regime uh, was about 105 degrees centigrade, and uh, we determined that off of a DMA curve as well. And uh, we see that this time, the fixation or fixity ratio um, doesn't matter. It doesn't have a really a strong dependence or fixation ratio doesn't have a strong dependence on um, the raster pattern whereas recovery does and again the longitudinal wins out in terms of recovery and uh, we're believing that that's because of the the alignment of phases um, so kind of interesting stuff um, i'll post this article as well for your reading pleasure and um, so we've talked about uh, fixation and recovery uh, rubbers recover very well and uh, you know we see this guy shooting his rubber bands, right? 
and uh, so a rubber shape memory polymers. And so the real question uh, I should ask is how do you uh, separate a rubber, okay, from a shape memory polymer? And uh, you do this with the shape memory index, and that's simply multiplying uh, the recovery ratio by the fixation ratio. And so the higher the number, the more of a shape memory polymer it actually is. And um, anyway, I've kind of talked about uh, quite a few things in this lecture. I kind of rambled on about shape memory mechanisms a little bit. Um, if you have any questions, always feel free to email me. Uh, this is a good place to stop. And I'll replace my usual, uh, this is the end of the lecture slide uh, with another example of shape memory polymers. And uh, I hope this has been interesting to you. And if, again, if you have any questions, feel free to email me.